Now, without further delay, I'd like to turn today's call over to your first speaker, Chuck Tomasi. Chuck, you have the floor. Hello, and welcome to TechNow, the web series for ServiceNow administrators and developers on a wide variety of platform topics. It is my pleasure to welcome you once again to Episode 60 of TechNow. My name is Chuck Tomasi. I am a senior TPMM at ServiceNow. Been here for about eight and a half years, coming up on a thousand, it feels like. And I was customer for a couple of years before that. It, uh, it, a lot of history. I'm not going to read the entire slide because Craig has a lot of great information on MidServer coming up. However, if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can find me on the community at ServiceNow. You can find me uh, on YouTube. I do a lot of a lot of stuff, including this one, of course. But just reach out for me on the community is probably the best way to get in touch with me. And with that, I'm going to turn over to our rock star of the, this episode, Craig Stepp. Hello, and as well, uh, we want to much time. Uh, and my name is Craig Stepp, and I'm uh, currently a senior curriculum developer at ServiceNow. I work in the training and certifications department. So any of the labs that you see or interact with, like at Knowledge, or maybe some of the classes that you may take through ServiceNow, uh, I handle the back end and spin up basically that I have built the infrastructure to uh, produce the instances that you use for those classes. And I do that for knowledge uh, in math, <laughs> uh, to say the least. And I've been in service now since uh, 2014, and uh, I'm into podcasting, photography, and Linux all day long. So that's me, and uh, I'll pass it over to Stacey. So uh, yeah, what's your time, Hi, everyone. My name is my name is Stacey Bailey. I'm a program manager in the training and certification department with Craig. I've been um, around the ServiceNow space first as a customer, then as a partner, and now as an employee since around 2014 also. Um, I apologize for my voice. I'm a little bit under the weather, uh, but very excited to learn more today about mid-servers. All righty. So our agenda today is we're going to co cover a community quick tip. This is just a quick tip that we thought is, is useful, wonderful platform feature that may be largely unrecognized by many of you. If some of you are familiar with it, all the better. But I uh, wanted to make sure that you know, every once in a while somebody comes and says, hey, how did you do that? We're going to be covering that very shortly. Uh, Steve, you've got one for you that I absolutely love and feel it is widely underutilized even by myself. And then we will get, of course, into the main topic around mid-servers. If you've got questions, type them into the, the Q&A panel that uh, Marvin spoke about earlier, and we will do our best to answer them. If we don't get to them, it's not because we don't like you. It's usually because we don't have time or we have to go back and research the topic. So we will post all questions and answers, unless they're, of course, duplicates or irrelevant, like, yes, I can hear you. If we're not going to post those to the community afterwards. As soon as we get the Q&A, we will post them. So surprise, surprise, we have an application in service now to help us manage all of this content. And that's going to happen. Yeah. 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 Ding, ring the bell. We just made a, a shameless self-promotion. <laughs> uh, speaking of shameless self-promotion, I want to remind you that Knowledge is coming up May 5th through 9th in Las Vegas of 2019. Don't know if you're watching this. Sometimes people watch these years later. We've been doing tech now for six years, and you may see commercials out there for Knowledge 13 coming up. Well, Knowledge 19 is, in fact, coming up as we record this, and I encourage you to go to knowledge.servicenow. Check out mm -hmm. the uh, check out the agenda. You can get signed up real, real soon. If not right now, I know that the, um, the pre-con training agenda is out, but you can't sign up for those yet. So that will be coming, I believe, in March, if my sources are correct. Lots and lots of great hands-on uh, labs and workshops. Don't forget to thank Craig for all the hard work of getting those instances set up with the proper mm. configuration and all that good information. The uh, Some of them even have mid-servers attached to them. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, they will. <laughs> I also want to remind you of our success center. This is actually an obsolete screenshot as of about a week ago. I encourage you to go to servicenow.com slash success where we have 50, it was the last count I got last week at our big sales kickoff, 50 best practices are documented out there. I even talked to somebody yesterday about getting another one up there, and I encourage you to look for the success navigator. This is an awesome tool. By answering a few short questions, it can give you a very concrete action plan that you can assign tasks to people and really walk through what is the journey 
of ServiceNow, whether you are just starting out or you are very mature in your processes and implementation, there is something here for you. So please, please look that up. Look for that, and uh, don't forget to check out the Success Navigator as well. Also want to put in a promotion for developer.servicenow.com. Since we are talking to a lot of developers, please go there, get a free personal developer instance, free learning plans. This is a great way to in, a, extend your career, expand your knowledge with the scripting APIs, with learning plans, go from admin to developer. If you're a developer on another platform and you want to learn more about ServiceNow, this is a great place to go. Dave and Andrew are putting developer blog content on there all the time, as well as videos, tons and tons of stuff. Please go check it out. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful resource. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Stacy for the Community Quick Tip. Jack, I'll start my screen share right now. Like you, uh, Syntax Editor macros have been part of the platform uh, since Fuji or before. So it, this has been around there uh, quite a bit. But in a lot of cases, people don't know about it. Think of Syntax Editor uh, macros as kind of text expanders for ServiceNow. So I've always kept an Evernote notebook of code clips and technical references. Um, but if we go to Syntax Editor macros, it's under system definition and available to anybody who has admin <coughs> access. When we take a look at these, we can see that we can easily create a new one. Um, there are two main parts, the name and the text. And if we type this into, say, a new uh, script include or any type of uh, script field, we can see a script field by the controls that we've got available. So we just saw a syntax editor macro called vargr. If I type vargr, that was in the name field, and press the tab button, then that expands that text to show me uh, my code. We can use this to make sure that we're following coding best practices, uh, keep track of some uh, useful code that we want to reuse in other places. So syntax editor macros are under system definition, and you can create your own. In searching the community and uh, just online, I've seen people publish their repositories of uh, various uh, syntax editor macros. One place where it would be very, very useful to use is when defining widgets in a service portal. If we go to uh, edit a widget, though, we see script fields here. But when I do var gr here and type tab, nothing happens. Uh, within the, uh, the script editor here, or the widget edit panel, these aren't exactly script fields. So I just want to spend one moment taking a look at how you can add syntax editor macro support for Service Portal. And if you search the community for Service Portal syntax editor macros, Dan Gibbard posted an article about a year ago that gives you guidance for how to do it. Super, super simple. He gives a UI script here, which we can copy to the clipboard. And of course, if you're watching this on replay, you can slow this down. Okay, so the first thing is a UI script. Uh, we'll call this widget macros and paste that code. Submit that. And then under service portal, We'll go to widgets, and this widget editing panel is actually a widget itself. So we find that, open it up, and scrolling down to the bottom of the widget edit panel, we see dependencies. We can create a new dependency. We'll call this widget macros. Right click and save to stay on the form, and then we see widget macros. So with those couple of steps, we can refresh our widget edit panel. Say a quick prayer to the demo gods. Mm -hmm. And there, now whenever we're creating new widgets or editing widgets in the widget editor panel, we now have syntax editor support. I love it. That's, That's cool. Very nice. Yep. Kudos. And there are a lot on my own system, and this is, this is fantastic. 
Yeah, I'm going to start transporting all the stuff that I've got in Evernote into probably a GitHub repository of syntax editor macros that I can mm. use on any instance. Mm. Okay, there you go. So I hope everybody finds that useful. So not only using syntax editor macros in scripting fields, but now you can use them in service portal as well. Thank you, thank you. All right, Craig, take us into the, the depths of mid-servers. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we're going to talk about mid-servers today, and I'm actually going to do an install and kind of go through that whole talk about the topology and all that kind of good stuff. But at first, before we get started, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Have you or do you use a mid-server? Uh, there's two difficult answers. It's 50-50, yes or no. I'm just curious to see how many people actually use mid-servers. Uh, you know, uh, the connect service now to your internal enterprise, or if you have a cloud environment and you want to do some operations on those machines, those virtual machines in your cloud environment, you can install a mid server in there as well. You know, have, you know, thing. or maybe I have one installed in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on a Raspberry. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Do I go ahead and move to the results now, or? Yeah, after you've given everybody a fair shake, go to the next slide and we'll see the results. Yeah. All right, here we go. Oh, here we go. 79% says hey, yes. Well, well, then, well, yeah, that's pretty good. All right, well, let's dive right in and take a look then. Hopefully we'll, we'll present uh, some people with some information they didn't know or, uh, or didn't know about their mentor or something new. So what is a mid-server? And it stands for Management Instrument Testing and Discovery. So a mid-server is a job application that runs on Windows or Linux. That's very flexible on where you can put it at. And it connects up to your instance and looks, monitors the ECC queue. And the ECC queue is really just a table that hosts um, what functions uh, that, not just the mid-server, but other things too, but the mid-server monitors for mid-server instructions. You, I'm, I'm doing a run in a PowerShell, we run in a, um, uh, a REST call or whatever. It monitors that table for instructions uh, and does them. So there's no connectivity from service now into your network, more it's from the, uh, your mid server that's inside your network out. So you don't have to worry about firewall rules and stuff, and we'll get into that a little bit. So it, it really facilitates the communication. And, Movement of data, you can copy files back and forth between ServiceNow and your instance and uh, communicate with external sources and services like AD or Microsoft AD or something like that. So why would you use a mid-server at all? And I kind of talked about that just a little bit here. But ServiceNow is outside your network. And then you, of course, are behind your firewall and inside your own network. So some ServiceNow applications actually require a mid-server to function properly because we obviously can't traverse that firewall uh, to get into your network. Or if we do, then you got a whole other security issue going on. We need to, you need to be behind the firewall. Some of the applications that do require uh, are discovery, orchestration, because we have the workflows that try to talk me in. Of course, like I said, discovery. We'll be looking for machines and trying to interrogate machines, service mapping, event management, uh, cloud and uh, information, uh, cloud management and operation intelligence flow designer now uses a mid server, uh, and of course REST, uh, REST API calls. Not uh, REST message APIs. Um, you know you can do from your instance, but we have mid servers doing that. They kind of distribute a load, and you don't have something talking straight to your your own instance. Um, other applications, uh, you know, you can see a list there. Uh, Altris. Um, Microsoft SCCM, Landesk, HP, OpenView, and the list goes on and on of all the applications that can make use of uh, a mid-server mid service now. So this is how it works. Here's the magic behind the curtain. The mid-server is installed on the system on your network. Again, it can be Linux or it can be uh, Windows. And there's some system requirements, and I put a bit.ly link there so you would be able to find it easily enough. It's bit.ly slash mid-rec, R-E-Q. 
And you can look at all the uh, all the requirements there. Um, just to give you a quick rundown, there's memory requirements that you got to watch out for. Java, you need to install Java. It used to be included with the mint server, and now it's not uh, because I think um, I don't know if it's legality or size of the package. It was uh, you know for manageability, but you go install Java on your own machine, and then you install the ServiceNow mint server. Uh, connects to your ServiceNow instance via SSL. So there's no connecting, like I said, through your firewall to your internal network. It's coming out. So generally speaking, you shouldn't have to modify your firewall or network topology to get to ServiceNow. It should just kind of connect and work. And the mid server connect uh, constantly monitors for activity. So it'll, it'll check that ECC queue and, um, and look for instructions. So if there's nothing to do, it just kind of sits idle and it keeps checking, uh, uh, like I said, um, uh, constantly. Uh, there's no charge for a mid server, so don't worry about uh, cost. Uh, some services like discovery and mapping, of course, have additional costs that, that do require the mid server. And to give you an illustration, as I've already talked to a little bit, there's your CMDB and ServiceNow up in the top left-hand corner, and there's your firewall that's not on fire. It's just an indication that that's your firewall, uh, bricks on fire. And then there's your internal network with all your different uh, applications with the mid server is able to talk to those. Now, also keep in mind that you can have more than one mid server, of course, talking to one instance. And because you may have different areas, so we'll give them IP ranges that they're in charge of. So when they pull uh, a, a command out of the ECC queue, the mid server knows which one it needs to talk, uh, you know, whether it can handle it or not. And also back capabilities. So capabilities like uh, PowerShell or SSH. Um, you know, like you don't want to run, try and run PowerShell on a Linux box. More or less, you want to do that on a Windows machine. So there's just a simple diagram of where the mid server kind of fits in all of this. And you can have the mid server talk through a proxy if you need to to get that out to the internet. Um, so there's there's those options as well. So we're going to start looking into some of the different things, some of the analytics we get from uh, running the mid-server. And there's a whole mid-server dashboard that not only gives you some insight on maybe one of them, that the CPU is going a little high, uh, get, this one's getting used a little bit more. You can kind of get some graphs and get an idea of what's going on. And we'll take a quick look uh, during my demo. I won't have a lot of data. You can see some pretty graphs, but you can get an idea of what you're what you're looking for. And of course. This screenshot has like it's like four mid servers at the top, and it will also give you some. There's an area that gives you some information on like errors or something to look out for. And of course, the installation is pretty easy actually. So when you install Java on your Windows machine, uh, we have a installer for Windows, not for Linux, but for Windows. And the installer will walk you through a setting. You just fill in the, the information, what's your username, what's your password, where's your ServiceNow instance with Earl, and then, of course, you can get a proxy information and test it. It'll let you test your connection before you actually try and spin up the machine. And then once it's done, kind of spin up the um, network start the mid server, and then it will uh, create the service and away you go. Now, what we're going to do today is I'm going to show. I can I'll show you the screenshot, uh, the installer, installer. But we're going to configure our service on mid by hand, and I'll show you some information about the wrapper file as you can make some changes. And that brings us to our demo. So let me switch over here. Screen share. We do the whole screen. All right, so here I am. I'm at my ServiceNow instance. And the first things first, you need to create a user for your mid server to be able to log into. Otherwise, your mid server would not have access to ServiceNow to do anything. So we're going to go to users. And I'll show you. I already have a user set up, but I do want to show you one thing. It's lab.midserver. And you can see Alfred Pennyworth. He's our butler, so to speak, for as our user. And he's going to be our mid server user. And when we create the mid server user, 
the one thing you need to make sure you add is the mid-server role. These other SOAP roles are all inherited. You can see the inherited count. The mid-server role gives, him access, gives us user access to be able to log in and interact with the ECC queue and run and create some records and, and whatnot. Of course, permission to apply elsewhere in the system, but that mid-server role is what you need. So you would just click Edit and add the mid-server role. There you go. That's, that's all there is to it. So make the user, make it a good, strong password. I can't stress that enough because you don't want some rogue uh, hacker getting in on your system because you had a simple password on your mid-server uh, account. But once you set up the account, okay, we've got that part ready to go. Now you need to go download your mid-server. So where do you get that from? So if we go to mid-server, you see right here it says downloads. Now, if you need some instru installation instructions, this will take you to the doc site. It talks about everything that I'm talking about today. Just wanted to point that out to you. So if you go to downloads, you'll see there's several options here. We have 32-bit uh, and 64-bit for Linux and Windows. Now, what we're going to do today by editing the files is pretty much the same on Linux. They have a config file. They have the wrapper file. It all, it's all the same. The only difference with Windows, of course, you have the, the nice installer. So what we'll do is we'll right-click on that, and we'll do copy link location. Uh, it might be a little different in your browser, but, yeah, copy link location, and then you're able to download it. Now, uh, you can down click on this, and it'll start downloading. Uh, for me, I wanted to download it straight directly to the mid server so I didn't have to try and upload it again somewhere. Um, again, you can see there's a link here to installation instructions if you get a little lost or you want to uh, um, uh, find a little more about something. So let's go over to my mid server. All right, and lo and behold, I've already downloaded. So I thought I would keep you guys from having to watch the paint dry. Is there I was downloading uh, a zip file. But here he is. We get the agent file. So we, we downloaded it. And now we need to extract it. So we want to put it in a certain place. You can put the, the mid server wherever you would like on your hard drive. But I'll try to keep it simple. Right off the root, I'll make a folder called, uh, you know, a folder called mid, uh, mid server and extract it there. So you can just, uh, you want to do extract all and mid-server, like that. And when you hit extract, it will start extracting into that folder. Now, it will make another folder inside mid-server, and I'll show you that. I've already extracted it because, again, I know you don't want to watch me do all that. So mid-server, it makes an agent folder. So we'll go in there. Here's all the files. Uh, there's not much really to interact with except for a couple of config files. So. The first one we're going to look at, and again, uh, you want to consult your memory and everything for this, this Windows machine because you don't want a, uh, a mid server that's running on too little memory. And make sure you have that Java already installed. I already have it installed on this machine. And you want Java, like JRE 1.8 or higher. And there's links to that, I think, in the Open JDK website. And um, we'll try and put some links to that with this, uh, with this show. So we've already got uh, we've got our mid server extracted. Here's the config file, which we'll interact with that in just a minute. But that's the one that really has all the configuration on how to talk to the service now instance that we're we're working with. And under conf, you'll see there's a wrapper.conf and a wrapper-override.conf. There's a lot of settings in here, and I'll I'll show you. Uh, I don't really interact with the wap the the wapper the, the wrapper.conf. Um, but you'll see there's a lot of settings on here, uh, talking about locations, uh, property files, uh, all this kind of stuff. I don't work with this so much. What we'll do is we will work with the wrapper override, because there's only a few settings that you really need to change. Or if it's just one bit server on here, you really don't need to change it all. I just wanted to point this out to you, that uh, you can change the name of the mid server. And you can see there's there's other settings in here you can override as well. Um, but right here, uh, the S and C underscore mid, if you were installing two mid servers on here, you would extract the file to another folder, 
and you would come into the wrapper con- override and change this maybe to, you know, mid, SNC mid two, because this is the name of the service that's on Windows, and you don't want to install a second one with the same name, because it will uh, affect the service, and it wouldn't know which which one to start. It was, it's confusing. You can even give it a, a nice display name. So if this was Windows mid server one that will be identified when we go look at the services. And you know what, I will save that and we'll, I'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. So remember the rocker dash override, you come in here to name the, the, the wrapper name and the display name. You don't have to do it. You don't necessarily have to do it, but let's go to config.conf, um, uh, XML, excuse me, opening code. All right. Right here is the meat of what you've got to change. It's, it's just the first few lines down. We want to put in the URL of your instance. So we'll go back over here to my machine, and we'll get the tech now to .lab.service.com. We'll slide that in there. And then we want to give it the username and password that has access to um, that this machine will should have access to service now. So we'll put lab mid server, and then we want to give it the correct password. Again, a good secure password. That would be this one right here. No, nope, not that one. <laughs> okay. And right here, you can name your mid server. So this uh, was what the name is going to represent in ServiceNow. So when you go look at your mid servers, you'll see a nice name that makes sense to you. So we'll call this one Windows Mid Server One. Yeah. So this is the first mid server. Again, this is the property for ServiceNow. What we changed a minute ago on the wrapper override was for the services paneling in Windows. So we'll save that. And we are ready to uh, start it up. But I wanted to show you before we start, I wanted to show you the installer. I mentioned a moment ago that Windows had an installer. And I'm going to recommend that you right click and run this as administrator just so it has access to be able to do what it needs to do on the system. And you'll see it'll take a moment and then the screenshot will pop up. And it already has some of this information popped in because we, we edited the config file ourselves. But there's the service URL, the service now instance URL, excuse me. Uh, there's the username and password. And we'll I think that's the same. Okay. And we can test the connection. And you'll see it's doing some work in the background. And the test, uh, it tested successfully. So we'll go next. There's uh, uh, some other things you can change. Again, there's the wrapper uh, name. And the mid server name, and we already did that because we edited the the, um, the config files already. But that's pretty much it. Once we're done, you would hit next, and you can install it. I'm going to stop here. So we've got everything set up. Right click, run as administrator. And you'll see it's starting up. It's created the service. Let's go to services. Just to verify, excuse me while I take a quick sip of water. And if we scroll down, Windows Mid Server 1, and there it is. So you can see that's where the description and the, and the name come in. And there's SNC Mid, which we saw in the config file. I'll close that. Now that the machine's, uh, now that it's running, let's switch back over to our ServiceNow instance. And let's take a look at uh, the mid server. So we're going to go to uh, servers, and we should see Windows mid server 1. And there it is. Now, before you can use this mid server, you have to validate it. So to validate it, it's really as simple as clicking the validate button. But what it'll do is it'll uh, set up the machine, it'll send over some keys so that everything's encrypted from end to end. 
It will be a valid date. And it asks me what kind of criteria. We're going to allow all applications to use this. Otherwise, if I turn this off, we can specify what applications we want. Allow all capabilities, SSH, PowerShell, um, any of those kind of functions, you can turn that on or off. Same thing with IP ranges. If you wanted to limit this one mid server to uh, one set of range, uh, one range in your data center, we can turn that off and we can specify that later. I'm not going to go into all that, but you can find that uh, in the docs file for all the uh, for all the mid server installations. So we will hit save because I wanted to be able, this mid server to be able to do everything. You can see it's already been validated. It's up. It's kind of doing that in the back end. You could go and say. And here's where you're going to go in and configure. You can do parameters, uh, supported applications, IP ranges, capabilities. Uh, and I'm not going to change any of that because that's a little bit outside of the scope of today. But you can find all that in the docs um, and, and modify those as you need. So let's go take a look at the dashboard. And you can see, I'll go ahead and close that. And you can see we've got mid-server status one. If we had more than one, you would see it listed here. And I want to show you this mid-server issue. Uh, there's not really an issue. that I had that lab that mid-server user created first before it was even attempted to uh, uh, attempted to, uh, connect it with that mid-server. So it was letting me know that I had a user with a mid-server role not associated with a mid-server. And it also tells you that there was no login attempts that there was to ever let you know, which I think is pretty important because, you know, your data is in here. You know, this is your CMDB. You want to make sure it's safe. Uh, just to show you, I can go to this, um, uh, this server issue, and I can mark it as acknowledged or resolved and update it. So no, no, nobody else would come in and, and take action on it. And I mentioned earlier that I probably would not have any graph data, but you can come in here and see the CPU and the max load on the memory and that kind of stuff as your uh, as your systems are running. And we don't have you know, any, any data to, to participate with. So, um, so I'm going to do a quick test. Now that we've got our mid server up, it's connected to this instance. I'm going to create, this is a very simple test, but what it does is I have a workflow in the back end, and the workflow has a PowerShell activity, and I can show you real quick. Workflow editor, how are we doing on time? I think we're still okay. Uh, yes, I'm just fine, Craig, go ahead. Okay. All right. So here's the workflow. I made a custom PowerShell to get data. It's just going to get the system information for the whatever system we tell it to go talk to. And I have a run script that will uh, populate the information as it comes back. So let's go new. We'll say host 127. Actually, an IP number right there. So we'll save this record. And I got a uh, UI action that will go out and let it take a moment. But it's now putting the uh, the um, the process that starts the workflow. The workflow puts in the information in the ECC queue. And uh, if I have a moment or two, I can show you the ECQ, ECQ and the data that came back. But there's the system information that we got back from our machine. And you can see the versions, uh, you know, the Windows system root. This is just general uh, PowerShell information. And, of course, you could do any PowerShell you wanted on this machine. And you can also have this mid server start talking to any of your machines inside of the, the network uh, with the right credentials that should be able to interact with your network. Let's go take a look at the um, the context. Turn my keyboard down. Context. All contexts. And let's go look at the ECC queue. Now it is a little confusing if you have to come in here and take a look at this when it sends stuff in and out from the mid server. Keep in mind the queue name. Is a little different. So, input is um, is where uh, the uh, the data that comes into ServiceNow. The output is what we sent to the mid server. So it's from the ServiceNow point of view. So just kind of keep that in mind. And here, there's the raw data that we got back. There you go.
Um, that's pretty much it. Is there any questions or anything? From the oh yeah, we got some questions. You want a few? Okay. <laughs> yeah. There was a question around the the Java version. What version of Java is required to run this? We know that it doesn't come with Java anymore because of licensing issues from Oracle. So what does somebody need to go get and download? Yes, uh, it's in the docs. You can go, get, I think if you just go to open JDK, um, and it's, uh, you know, I'll pull it up. Open JDK with a download. Uh, of course, I didn't get in the right spot. But you want uh, JRE 1.8, which I think it listed as 8 dot something, uh, but you'll find it in there. Um, so we do support Open JDK. That was another question that came up. You don't have to yeah, go to okay. Oracle and get the, the JRE. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, I was good to know. Uh, yeah, I was trying to look in here for it. But you can I find think it. it I'm, you know, I'm not seeing anything, Craig, but the uh, you know, slide is flashing a little bit on this end. So I don't know if you stopped your screenshot or not, but that's all right. Oh, I, I did. I'm sorry. I was trying to pull up a tab I was going to share. But, yeah, if you go to open JDK, uh, you should be able to find it. I've installed I've, – I've used Oracle's. So I've used uh, uh, open JDK and there's a couple others, but uh, I would recommend one of those too, though. Okay. Another common question I'm seeing is do you – if you have a dev – Test and prod instance, do you need a separate mid server for each of those? Yes, you can't have one mid server login into three different machines. So, yeah, okay. that would be the case. And you know, a lot of people do that because they, they have a test network on their local internal uh, thing. So, you, you know, you really, yeah, you really want to keep those separate. And if you're, especially when you're working with AD or something like that, you don't want to, you know, <laughs> remove a bunch of users that weren't supposed to be removed. So, yes, I would recommend. Having or not necessarily recommend you have to have them in separate uh, uh, a mid server per instance. Search down. You could, however, put multiple mid servers on the same physical or virtual server. Correct. Yeah, I, I did mention that earlier. Yes, you can do that. You would extract like I, when I extracted the file, uh, the the zip file. You put it in its own folder, a, a special folder, uh, a named folder for itself. And you would have its own thing. You can have more than one. Just remember to over edit that override, uh, wrapper override uh, comp file and give it a different name if you have more than one mid server on there. And I'm talking about the service name, not necessarily the name name. So, what would be other than other than talking to different instances? What would be the advantage of having multiple mids on the same server instead of just increasing the resources for a given mid? Um, that I, w I would say that um, having multiple mid uh, mid servers on one machine. That's if you know if you wanted to put your mid server, well, put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, and you had a test room prod, you wouldn't have to have like five machines, you know, for all your mid servers. You could just have them all on one. Uh, I don't know that I see really another advantage, except for maybe one of them is in charge of accepting events. Only, and maybe one of them's in charge of doing discovery only, but it's still on the same machine. So I don't know what kind of advantage you get from that, but maybe uh, just accepting uh, events and stuff because that can be kind of uh, taxing on a machine. So I would add to that. And, I would add to that and say, you know, we could do fault tolerance or load balancing the same way too. If you had multiple mids, I'll talk into, let's say, your prod instance. Mm -hmm. You had three mids on the same. It's, it's, let's call it a VM for now, but it, it, whether it's a VM or a, a physical machine doesn't matter. But if you've got three of them talking to your production instance, you could, like you said, give them different tasks and say, mm -hmm. this one is for discovery, this one is for event management, this one is for integrations. Then if there's an issue with one of those, you're not impacting the other one. If the service goes down or, or something of that nature. Well, the, even the then, two, well, even then, yeah. I might want to, I, you may want to split those up on, Two different machines, physical machines. Yeah, you like could. That. You could obviously do that and, and spread the spread the load around onto different VMs. I think the the moral of that story is that there's a lot of options you can do. You can put several of them on one machine or spread them out. And it's very flexible. Yep. Yep. So. Did you did you mention licensing? Yes, I did earlier. Some of the products okay. that we we have that require a mid server. 
our extra cost, but not the mid server itself. You can, you know, you can have ten mid servers, and it's, it's, it's just fine. It costs anything extra. All right, we have over a hundred other questions that need answering, but I think we're going to have to get those offline later. <laughs> okay, I can't even scan through them fast enough right now. That's fine. So uh, I wanted to go over a couple of quick things. Uh, I got a few more slides here. One of them was considerations when upgrading your mid server. Uh, sometimes uh, permissions uh, on Linux is an issue. I ran into that before where I was like, why is this mid server not auto upgrading? It was because some of the files didn't have the right uh, permission so that they couldn't overwrite them. Um, also note that we had this problem before. I think it was from Kingston. I'm trying to remember it was a King Jakarta. One of them, the age of the mid server was an issue because they uh, changed the encryption uh, up from one version to the other. So when we up, when I updated my employee instance to whatever version of Kingston, I guess, and uh, my mid server quit working because it could not have update. So that's some consideration. And, you know, it's easy to download and reinstall it. It's, uh, it's not the end of the world, but just keep that in mind that, you know, these mid servers will auto update. So um, if you let them. Um, yeah, you know, and if your network topology has changed and you all of a sudden have a Chicago office or whatever, you know, kind of keep that in mind. You can spread these things out and, uh, you know, have some that are uh, in one office and another. So just keep, uh, you know, topology can be an issue. So some best practices, like, like I mentioned, topology, location, 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 that's very important. Uh, the time to get data from one, you know, from your internal network to a mid server can be uh, greatly reduced if you have some mid servers where the data is actually at or close to it. So keep that in mind. Memory and space requirements. Again, go refer to the docs. I could talk about it here, but the, the combination is kind of, kind of long. So you may want to look at that. When I say combinations, how much memory you add extra memory. Now, if you have more than one, uh, mid, that's something else. They do share some memory space, but then you would add an extra one gig per mid rather than if you have one machine, it's got eight gigs, you know, for one, for, uh, one machine, uh, I'm saying that they kind of share the majority of that memory because of the nature of the job environment. So if you have two mids on there, you can reduce your, your memory costs, uh, because they kind of share a little bit. And that might be a advantage of having more than one on one machine. Uh, threads and memory, uh, you want to keep an eye on that because uh, you can increase or decrease that. The more threads you got, the more memory you're going to take. So, but the faster you can get things done. So there's that balance that you know, seesaw balance that you, you know everybody kind of deals with all kinds of things here. Uh, you'll have that kind of situation. And of course, local network user permissions. You want to make sure that your uh, when you're, the systems you're interacting with that your mid server is talking to inside your network has the right user permission, not like uh, car blanche. You want to make sure that it's narrowed down to what you need or a subset of what you need because you don't want to delete all of your AD users or containers or whatever by accident. So keep that in mind. And that, that's uh, also, like I said, uh, kind of a best practice for if you have a test environment, make a test mid server and kind of segment all that off. And down to our reference information, you can go to the docs uh, site at docs.servicenow.com, or servicenow.com, scratch the dash, community.servicenow.com, the developer site at developer.servicenow.com. And you can go to our plethora of library, uh, library shows uh, for TechNow at bit.ly slash servicenow-technow. And of course, you can go to our other site, servicenow.com slash success, or customer success. You're stealing my stick, man. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hey, wait a minute. There's plenty of stick. There you go. There's plenty of stick. All right. Remember that we are doing the questions and answers. I answered, oh, it feels like a thousand of them currently have another 2,000 left to go. Uh, but thank you very much for all the Q&A. They will be posted on the community at community.servicenow.com. If you search for TechNow episode list, you will find the list of them. Go to episode 60, and we'll have all the details there. It will take a couple of days for us to get that turned around so that we can answer all remaining 
well, I'm seeing about 118 questions that still need answering. So give us a little uh, a little love in doing that. I also want to remind you that we have a link in the resource panel, if you haven't opened that up already, in the resource panel of this webinar, you will find your registration for next month's webinar, Explore the Madrid Platform Feature. So I want to call your attention to that and get you signed up already for that. I think this is the furthest in advance we have ever had in open registration. And look forward to, I'm, I'm very, very excited about the Madrid release. It's available at developer.servicenow.com on the personal developer instances. I forgot to mention that earlier. So if you want to start exploring Madrid, the docs are available at docs.servicenow.com. You can get yourself a personal developer instance, do some running around, testing, make sure it works, convince your boss that it's time to upgrade, that kind of thing. And we will be walking you through some of the highlights from the platform level, not going into customer service management or IT service management or HR, we will have separate content for those. This webinar series is all about developers, admins, the platform, custom applications, and that's what we're going to be covering in the February 26th. Mark your calendars, same bat channel, same bat time, 8 p.m. Pacific time, or excuse me, 8 a.m. Pacific time, wanna make sure I'm on the right side of the world, 8 a.m. Pacific time, February 26th, Tech Now, Episode 61, all about the Madrid platform features. And boy, howdy, it's going to be, it's it's so big, it's going to overflow into March and April. That's how bad yeah. it is. <laughs> so if you've got any questions, of course, there is ways to contact us. You can do that via email. We've got the YouTube content. I did have a number of people ask where can they get this recording. This is available on the community. Again, if you search for that or use the bit.ly link that you saw back there. You can find it there along with all the other episodes. It will also be available on YouTube on the Now Community channel in the TechNow playlist. So hopefully we've answered all your questions and uh, or will be soon. And As I say, or will be, yeah. Th thank you very much, everybody, for attending today's webinar. We will give you back a few minutes of your day and look forward to seeing you in February on Madrid. Take care. Thanks. Bye.